Uh, Dr. Stephanie Kelton is with us uh, again, she, uh, and, and welcome very much back. She is the chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, uh, creator and editor of the New Economic Perspectives blog, neweconomicperspectives.org, and uh, Twitter is at Stephanie, uh, E-P-H-A-N-I-E, Kelton, K-E-L-T-O-N. Dr. Kelton, welcome back to the program. Thank you for having me. Good it, to be back. It is great having you with us. I'm so sorry that I missed the first uh, few minutes. Uh, I, I was on the other side of town in a TV studio uh, doing an interview with Larry King, and, and we were having all kinds of technical problems, and it just became wild. And so, anyhow, I'm, but thank you for showing, showing it back up with us. You're, um, you're welcome. Uh, so let's start out with, you know, it's been, a, it's been a while since we've talked about modern monetary theory, and, and one of the things that, uh, really uh, piqued my interest was uh, Randy Ray the other day talking about MMT actually does policy. You can draw, you know, you can make policy conclusions out of MMT. So if we could start at the beginning, how does an economy work? And what does that tell us about our current economic policies uh, to the extent that they exist in the, you know, outside of the vacuum of politics or, or uh, pretending that they do? Um, and what we should be doing. Well, how does the economy work? I guess the very simplest way and the way that I often say it when I travel and give talks to audiences that usually don't have much of an interest in economics is just to say it as simply as possible, which is to say an economy like ours, a capitalist economy, runs on sales. And then I just simply go from there. So if you have an economy that runs on sales, then what you're saying is, uh, we've got a, you know, a lot of businesses in the economy that hire workers and pay them wages and salaries. And with that income, workers go out and buy back some of the goods and services that are produced by firms both here in the U.S. and elsewhere. Some of the income that they earn goes to savings. Some of the income that they earn is taxed away from them. And so the economy works when there is enough demand for the goods and services that firms are producing and trying to sell at a profit, because it's capitalism, uh, to keep us close to full employment. And when the, when the spending power is not there and the demand is not there, well, then businesses get uh, pretty disappointed. Their inventories start building up, sends a pretty clear signal to them that uh, they've overproduced, and it gives them an incentive to lay off workers and scale back production. So it's this constant attempt to try to scale the production in the economy to satisfy largely consumer demand. Wow. So it's, uh, I mean, this this is, in a way, uh, Adam Smith, uh, Wealth of Nations, 1776, uh, David Ricardo, 1809, you know, it's kind of basic econ 101. How did we get from understanding that economies are driven by demand to this weird idea in the 1980s that somehow economies were actually driven by supply. And if we simply made sure that there was lots and lots of billionaires and lots and lots of money at the top, and maybe lots and lots of goods in the stores, and the, the, the one example, of course, is always, well, Steve Jobs invented the iPhone, and suddenly there was demand for it. Um, the, you know, how did we get to this weird demand-side notion? Well, uh, Keynes sort of fell out of favor. You know, we go through transitions in economics and different schools of thought sort of take turns uh, leading the academy and dominating policymaking. And so uh, for a period of time, really in the 70s and leading up into the 1980s with Thatcher and Reagan and the supply side revolution and so forth, you, you got a real paradigm shift in economics where People started to think more in terms of incentives. The unemployed were unemployed because they lack the proper incentives to go out and search for work. They were, by and large, lazy and shiftless. Uh, and, and so what you had to do was, you know, remove the, the so-called disincentives to work. You had to take away minimum wages or uh, remove uh, the social safety net or at least substantially uh, reduce the social safety net so that, you know, this is where the idea of, of a hammock comes from. Right. Uh, and, and that businesses, what they need most is not customers with money to spend, but in fact, uh, big tax cuts. Because, you know, if you deregulate businesses and provide them with lots of tax incentives, then somehow this is going to cause them to go out and spend on new machines, build new factories, and hire workers, and it's the trickle-down story that you described. It's a fantasy, though. I mean, it it's, is a, just, there, it's never happened in the history of the world, has it? 
No, no, it is a fantasy, and it's bad. It's bad economics. And on this, on the face of it, most people would understand that. You know, if you know a small business owner, you know that it's true that small business owners will tell you that they feel like their taxes are too high, and they feel like regulations are burdensome, and so forth. But at the end of the day, if there's a line of customers waiting to get in and a line of orders for the goods and services that they produce, they don't lay off the staff, right? They add to demand. So it's really consumer demand that drives things. And, and it's a convenient excuse for businesses to say, well, the reason I'm not hiring right now is because the regulations are so onerous. So the reason I, I'm uh, holding back right now, adding to my workforce, is because uh, I need some additional tax incentives. And then businesses just simply... Uh, say, well, okay, you know, we can do that. And so we give them, you know, all kinds of incentives. And, and we've seen this over the course of the last five years, trying to deal with the consequences of the Great Recession, right? 100% acceleration of depreciation. Let businesses uh, invest in new machines and depreciate them all in year one. Cut taxes, deregulate, you know, all the sorts of things that they say they were looking for. And we still don't have the kind of robust demand for labor that uh, we should have to get us back anywhere close to full employment. So they're getting, they're getting everything they want, but they're not getting what they need most, which is lots of consumers with incomes that are high enough to sustain uh, demand, to have us going back into the stores and, and buying the stuff that they produce. At what point do the people, the titans of industry, at what, time, at what point do the, the, the lobbyists for the, the Chamber of Commerce, the the, the, the businesses of America realize that uh, this is what George Herbert Walker Bush called voodoo economics and that we've been doing it for 33 years and it still isn't working and start demanding uh, a return to rational economic policies, including an increase in the minimum wage, for example, uh, you know, extending unemployment insurance, possibly making the, governor, uh, the government the employer of last resort. I, I'd love to get your thoughts on that and, and also on the, on the budget, budget deficit and debt. Uh, at, at what point do they say, you know, uh, Dr. Kelton is right, uh, we actually need customers, and here's how we get customers. Well, you see I, it happening? I, I thought I saw it happening a little bit. Um, you remember after the fiscal cliff drama and the sequester and so forth, and one of the things that happened is that payroll taxes increased. So, you know, we had that little reduction in the withholding from workers' paychecks, the FICA line on your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we got by way of stimulus was a 2% cut in the payroll tax. And so everybody who's working for a living and paying into Social Security for a period of a little over a year, maybe closer to two, saw their take-home pay increase by 2%. It was a 2% cut for the worker, not the employer, but for the worker. And many of us didn't even feel it. You know, our pay went up. 2%, and it was small for those of us in a higher income category, but for those, you know, near the bottom, uh, it was a huge difference for them. It made the difference between maybe filling a prescription and having one more meal out or one more, you know, pair of jeans for the kids or something like that. And when the payroll tax cut expired uh, at the start of, June, of January 2013, payroll taxes went up by 2%. I didn't feel it. But a lot of people did. And by the first week of February, the executives at Walmart, managers and executives, were circulating internal memos. And I remember specifically, because they were leaked to the public, one of them said, where are all the customers? And I thought, wow, they're feeling it already. You know, it's only six weeks, five weeks into this thing, and already Walmart is seeing an impact uh, of, you know, people with less disposable income. So I don't know uh, at what point, I, I'm not terribly optimistic, I guess, to be honest, but um, I don't know at what point how bad things have to get before businesses turn to sensible economics and away from things like, well, you know, I'm for privatizing Social Security because that's a way to get my wage costs reduced by the contribution that employers have to make, which is 6.2%. Oh. That's pretty costly for um, both the worker and the employer contributing to Social Security. So one of the things you do see CEOs lining up to advocate is uh, privatization of Social Security. Because if you, if you relieve them of the obligation to contribute that 6.2%, it's effectively like reducing across the board the, the wage bill by 6.2%. So you get that sort of thing advocated, but not really good policy that raises the incomes of, of workers and, and puts more customers into their stores. Yeah, that doesn't, and that doesn't put any more customers into our stores. 
Um, we have just, just one minute before we have to take a very, very brief break. Um, but uh, I, I, I've been developing this theory that, you know, there's this theory about the, this battle in the Republican Party between the old-fashioned GOP and the, and the uh, Tea Party. What if what's really going on is that there's a battle between people who actually do business and understand business, which would be the old-fashioned GOP, hmm. and a group of basically billionaires who are uh, who have OCD, who who have hoarding syndrome, and they're just you know trying to get more and more and more money, and are not so concerned about you know the economy and how all these things work as long as they can get more and more and more. Am I out on thin ice here? I don't think you are. I mean, I think this is exactly, and, and they're doing it, right? I yeah. mean, we're seeing it. They're, they, they're very uh, much accomplishing that end. Yeah. Okay. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. If you can hold on just a, just a second, we'll be right back. Dr. Stephanie Kelton is with us. She's the chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, the creator and editor of the New Economic Perspectives blog, neweconomicperspectives.org. And you can tweet her at Stephanie, I-E, Kelton, K-E-L-T-O-N. We'll be right back. Dr. Kelton, welcome back, and thanks for sticking sticking with us. Um, just so you know where we're at and what we're doing, um, our commercial stations, which is about half of our listenership, just left us to go into a commercial break. Our non-commercial stations, our Pacifica stations, and our Free Speech TV viewers, which is about half our audience, are still with us. And okay. so it, it, the commercial break is four minutes long. We'll talk during that. Uh, we'll hit another break just like that one. When we come back, I'll summarize in a half a minute or so whatever we talked about. And uh, then we'll have our whole audience back for the rest of the, until the top of the hour. Okay? Okay. So, um, uh, your thoughts on what we can, can or should do about where we're at right now. How do we fix this economy that is so badly broken? Well, I think, you know, I, early on in the aftermath of the crisis, we, um, the group of economists that get referred to as the sort of MMT school, we were advocating for really three things. We wanted to see a full payroll tax holiday, and we wanted it for the worker and the employer. And this was when we recognized that the, uh, the downturn was likely to be much more severe than most economists and, and most pundits and I think politicians understood. And so we thought that we needed aggressive payroll tax cut to put money in the hands of people who are most likely to do two things, and both are really important. One was that, you know, we had a recession that, um, that followed a period of tremendous leverage, that the private sector borrowed a, a whole lot of money and drove themselves into an extremely high uh, debt situation, and they were going to be looking to pay down debt and deleverage, and we needed to allow that to happen. And one way to put money into the hands of people who are looking to save more and spend less and pay down debt was to go directly through the paycheck and, and reduce payroll taxes. So we wanted that to happen. And then for those who weren't struggling with high debt, who would take the additional income and go out and spend some or, or all of it, uh, that would then provide the customers that would lead to the job creation and so forth. So we wanted the payroll tax holiday. We recognized that state and local governments were hemorrhaging. Taxes had fallen off a cliff. They were laying off public sector workers left and right, and we needed to stem the crisis. Now, we did some of that, but we recognized that it, it probably needed to be quite a bit bigger, distributed on a per capita basis, aid to help state and local governments uh, shore up their own balance sheets and avoid the kinds of cuts and layoffs that we had seen. And then the third thing was really to mop up everything that was left behind to deal with the fact that uh, you never get and sustain full employment in a capitalist economy. It just doesn't happen. Capitalist economies are dynamic. They go through periods of boom followed by busts, followed by booms and so forth, and the cycle repeats. And there are always more job seekers than there are job vacancies. We never get close to keeping the economy at full employment. So for everyone who's ready, willing, and able to work, but not able to find employment in the economy, either in the private or public sector, we wanted a, a federally funded jobs program modeled on the WPA, the CCC, the National Youth Administration, which provided, um, you know, this is, these are Roosevelt programs. These are New Deal programs, right? The National Youth Administration took care of 
the young folks who couldn't find jobs. And so we've got unemployment rates hovering around 20% for young people. So those are the sorts of things that we wanted then and that I would still support now. Yeah, and it and it all has worked in the past. It's, you know, unlike supply-side economics. It's incredible. Dr. Stephanie Kelton, we will be back in, in uh, 20, 30 seconds here. Uh, the chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, New Economic Perspectives. We'll be right back. Tom Hartman here. I'm coming to Portland on May 2nd to the First Unitarian Church in the Main Street Sanctuary, Fuller Hall. I'll be giving a talk starting at 7 p.m. about my new book, The Crash of 2016. The United States is in the midst of an economic implosion that could make the Great Depression look like child's play. Find out what we need to do right away. Before and after the event, local groups active in the actions will be in Fuller Hall to meet with attendees to provide points of entry for the fight. There's more details at firstunitarianportland.org or TomHartman.com. Welcome back. Ten minutes before the hour. Tom Hartman here with you. Dr. Stephanie Kelton, the chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, creator and editor of the new EconomicPerspectives.org blog, is on the line with us. And Dr. Kelton, you, you, you were suggesting that we should have uh, New Deal kind of programs, government as employer of last resort, bring back the WPA and CCC, uh, the National Youth Program, things like that. And that we should also have a, a, a tax holiday, at least with regard to the payroll tax, so that immediately average working people, the payroll tax is only paid on the first $116,000, $117,000 worth of income, if I recall correctly. That's right. um, so working people would immediately see an increase in their net wealth, so they would become more aggressive consumers, they'd be able to pay down their debt, and, and once again participate in the economy. Um, if that's your policy prescription... How do you respond to the inevitable uh, freakout that comes from that, which is, oh, my God, you're talking about adding $3 trillion to the U.S. debt? How'd you get to $3 trillion? I just made it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I, okay. I'm, I'm guessing if the, if the original Obama stimulus was $800 billion, and it was really only 500 because it was all the tax cuts, but, you know, and that took us you know, uh, not even a third of the way, I figured it would have to be at least three times larger than that to be successful, and that's why I, I pulled $3 billion out of my... Okay, ear. okay. Well, you know, my colleague Randy Ray and I, we've written some uh, pieces on this, and um, it, it, we could get to full employment, we estimated in a most recent piece, I think we did for Truth Dig, uh, for something more like $300 billion. So uh, we're talking about a very different number. Wow. First, yeah. Uh, now, the infrastructure, it, job creation, direct job creation and so forth, well, that depends how you deploy those, those workers. Now, one of the things that I've always uh, thought that we ought to be doing is um, addressing our infrastructure deficit. I mean, we have got a huge problem in this country, and we put it off. And every couple of years, the American Civil Engineers Society comes out with a report card, and they give grades, you know, like letter grades, like you get on a report card when you're a kid. And they grade our uh, infrastructure, everything from our ports and our railways to our bridges and water treatment facilities, levees, you know, the whole gamut. And the, the overall grade in the most recent report card is a D plus. And that actually turns out to be good news because the one they did two years prior, we had a D. And so the good news is our grades are going up. The bad news is so is the price tag to address the problem. So the latest infrastructure report card says that the United States of America needs to spend an estimated $3.6 trillion just to get its infrastructure up to snuff. So we've got 24 million Americans today, right now, who want full-time work and can't find it. This is not the official number. This is the broader measure of unemployment that includes all the part-timers who are part-time for economic reasons. That is, their employers have cut their hours. They want to be full-time, but they can't get enough hours. And all the discouraged workers who simply gave up and dropped out of the labor force, but who say that they would take a job tomorrow if it were available. So you add those two groups to the you know, official numbers that we're more familiar with being reported, and you get... Oh, we just lost Dr. Kelton. Oh, it's trying to reconnect. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> the wonders of uh, of uh, talking on Skype. 
Um, the point that she was making earlier, I think, that is is a point that is so, and we haven't even gotten to taxes. Um, but the, but the point that she was making that I thought was so so brilliant is, you know, we did this before. We did this in the 1930s. It worked. It put people back to work. We can we can we can hire people. We can have the government be the employer of last resort. And and this idea that. You know, we need to we need to hold we need to do away with these uh, with things like long term unemployment insurance because it's a disincentive to work. As Paul Ryan says, we've we've created a hammock out of a safety net. It's nonsense. And in fact, we need to be providing these people with this cash now. The Republicans have been withholding it since three days after Christmas. We have her back, Doctor Kelton. You're back. I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. Skype croaked. Um, so, so finish your thought. Uh, well, I was talking about the infrastructure yeah, and the amount said, of spending and how many folks we have. So we've got all these people that we could use. We have useful things for them to do. The more we wait, the bigger the problem becomes. And it, it just seems to me a no-brainer. And it was also the kind of thing that used to be a no-brainer in Washington because infrastructure investment used to enjoy broad bipartisan uh, support. You know, both parties understood that you invest in your nation's infrastructure, that it increases productivity. And so, you know, this is good for businesses. It's good for workers. This was just a no-brainer. And now we can't even do the sorts of things that, you know, 20 years ago, 12 years ago, were no-brainers. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, and 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 person, you know, I have theories on that. And I think it's largely political, and it has to do with the Democrat in the White House and and yeah. sabotage and et cetera. But uh, do you think that? First of all, do you think that another crash is coming? Or do you think that this uh, two thousand seven two thousand eight thing has, is over? I definitely think another crash is coming. They all they always do. It is uh, we've done nothing really to prevent the next crisis from occurring, it, especially in in financial markets. We didn't learn the right lessons from what happened last time, so we do not have the safeguards in place. I don't think to prevent the next crisis, as my colleague Bill Black says, uh, we enjoy now, and I use enjoy in quotation marks, uh, recurring and intensifying financial crisis. So not only will there be another one, but in all likelihood it will be even worse than the last one. Wow. So what, what should the average person do? Uh, well, I, the, the only thing I can think of is to say that the average person needs to understand somehow that the deregulation that, that we are, I think, inclined to tend to support because it's sold in such a persuasive way that you know there are all these unnecessary, onerous regulations... We need to re-regulate, we need to end too big to fail, we need to break up the big banks, and we need to... So really the average person needs trans- to get politically active, basically. They do, yeah. they do. And economically literate. They do. And you are making a huge contribution to that, and I thank you so much for dropping by today. We, w- we will do this again, I hope, soon. Thank you, Tom. Thank I'd you, Dr. You. Stephanie Kelton, NewEconomicPerspectives.org.